it's a common catchphrase to say that nobody is perfect, that perfection is an impossible dream. This is a view that informs the way people think about a range of subjects from mathematics to morality to human nature. But why do people think that? Do they have a good reason for adapting, adopting such an influential viewpoint? Not everyone thinks so. Well, welcome to New Ideal, the podcast of the Ayn Rand Institute. Today, we're going to discuss this topic, why perfection is possible. I'm Ben Baer, a fellow and instructor at the Ayn Rand Institute, and with me is Dr. Harry Binswanger. Dr. Binswanger is an objectivist philosopher and was an associate of Ayn Rand's for many years. Uh, he's now also a member of ARI's board of directors. He's the author of How We Know, Epistemology on an Objectivist Foundation and the Biological Basis of Teleological Concepts. He's uh, was also the editor of the Ayn Rand Lexicon and the expanded second edition of Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. He also authored a 1981 article called The Possible Dream, which deals with the very subject that we're going to be discussing today. Uh, it's an article that we recently had the privilege of reprinting in the journal of the Ayn Rand Institute, New Ideal. Uh, Harry was also my teacher for many years in the Objectivist Graduate Center, so I'm very happy to welcome him to a conversation today about his article and about the general topic of why perfection is possible. Hi, Harry, welcome. Hi, I'm glad to be here. So maybe we should start off with a, a question about the title of this article, uh, which uh, I believe is a reference that maybe some in our audience might not be aware of. What can you tell us about that? There was a song, a very popular hit song called The Impossible Dream, which was from the play Man of La Mancha, which opened, I believe, in 1969 off-Broadway, and I saw the production. The theme of both the play and the song is that Ideals cannot be achieved in reality. In fact, if you try to achieve ideals in reality, you must be insane. But it's a beautiful kind of insanity. It's preferable to the cynical, realistic uh, po uh, view or attitude that says ideals are not possible. We've just got to accept that life stinks and live in reality, which is a bad place to be but it is what we got to do. So this article was written to say there are no impossible dreams. There are no ideals divorced from reality. Your ideal must be formed on the basis of reality that perfection is the full achievement of a realistic standard. So it completely turns upside down the traditional view. Well, perfection is a great thing to aim at, but you can't get it. So that's an example of how this common attitude about the impossibility of perfection was, uh, you could see it in the, even in the pop culture of the 1970s. Uh, he, I have an example of where we see in the pop culture today. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, the sitcom The Good Place, yeah. which was this. Uh, I mean, it's very unique uh, sitcom in, in that the major subject of it was moral philosophy. Uh, the the guy who created the show and wrote the show, Mike Schur, recently wrote a book uh, about what he uh, thought he learned about philosophy from doing the show, and the book is called How to Be Perfect. And you can see from uh, the, the way the, the title is on the, the, the cover that uh, that's kind of a joke, that he thinks, um, he thinks you can't actually be perfect. And so the title is a joke. And I thought I would read a passage for you from that book where he elaborates on that idea. And I'd like to hear your reaction, especially in light of some of the things that you say in your article. So here's what Schur writes. So he says, so, we're going to ask questions about what to do in certain situations and attempt to answer them using some ideas that are 2,400 years old and some that were proposed basically yesterday. By the time the book is done, we will know exactly how to act in every conceivable situation so as to produce a verifiably maximal amount of moral good. We will be perfect. People will gaze upon us with awe and admiration. All our friends will be so jealous. I'm kidding. We're still gonna fail all the time. But again, that's okay. So let's start failing, or in the words of Samuel Beckett, try again, fail again, fail better. 
And then later in the book, he writes, okay, and then this is answering a question that he's anticipating from his audience. He anticipates they'll ask, you're just some guy, who the hell are you to judge me? And he responds, yeah, I thought you might ask this question. So listen, this book is in no way meant to make you feel bad about whatever dumb stuff you've done in your life. It's certainly not meant to suggest I haven't done a bunch of dumb stuff in my life because I definitely have and I continue to. Nobody's perfect. As we'll see in chapter five, moral perfection is both impossible to attain and a bad idea to even attempt. Again, this goal is to, the goal is to embrace our inevitable failures and find a way to get some use out of them, to learn ways to benefit when we make mistakes instead of just stewing in our own guilt, doomed to make those same mistakes over again. Reactions? I think it's disgusting. I watched The Good Place and thought it was uh, an interesting premise with great actors, good sets, but it just fell apart. It, it, it didn't work and his philosophy doesn't work. It's, uh, he's trying to deal, he's, he's trying not to deal with the separation of the ideal from the real. And the idea that we shouldn't judge is responsible for things like Putin invading the Ukraine. If the United States and the West had morally judged him long ago, long ago, the moment he took off then the invasion, he would not be in power. If we had sold our um, morals with moral certainty, our condemnation of a man who was a KGB operative and high up in the KGB, becoming the dictator of Russia. So it's a terrible attitude to say, you can't be perfect, life stinks, but I'm going to tell you how to make the most of it. So sure, is, among other people, utters this, this catchphrase that nobody's perfect, almost as though it's something that everybody knows and that we should all just take for granted. But in reality, this, this idea, it has a history and it came from somewhere. What can you tell us about where it comes from, philosophically? Well, it comes, it comes from religion and broader than that, mysticism and supernaturalism. The Greeks would not have understood the idea you can't be perfect. Plato did sell the idea in geometry, by, but he had to argue for it because it was not the Greek view. The Greek view was the good is a value to you and you can get it. That was a much healthier culture. But after Christianity, it's become commonplace to think you can't live with moral perfection because you'd have to kill yourself. You'd have to die on some cross like Christ did. So the origin of this anti-perfection idea is a mystical, supernatural, anti-human idea of what perfection would be. That's a very interesting observation, especially because people like Schur in his book, he explicitly says that he's trying to offer a secular take on ethics. And I, I suspect that a lot of other people who who mouth this catchphrase also don't regard themselves as religious. And yet they're what you're saying is that they're relying on this essentially religious idea. And I mean, that might be eye opening, uh, at least to some of them. Yes, they all hold the Christian ethics, the best example of that is Marx. Marx was a crusading atheist. Religion was persecuted in the Marxist Soviet regime, right? I mean, everybody knows how strongly atheist Marx was. But his ethics is Christ. It's the Sermon on the Mount. His slogan, from each according to his ability to each according to his need, is something Jesus would have said if he'd been smart enough to think of it. So they all accept the Christian morality and just secularize it. That's what sure seems to be doing. You already talked about how this idea that nobody's perfect is, uh, I mean, you outlined a way in which you thought if we hadn't 
been acting on that assumption, we had we would, uh, for instance, never have given Vladimir Putin the credibility that he's cashed in on in the recent war in Ukraine. Can you say more about uh, other consequences of what it means to act on this idea in real life? How is it used today? What is it used to justify? Well, the most important consequence and use of it is in personal, moral, and psychological life. To an individual person who accepts the idea you can't be perfect ideals, well, that's Christ and you have to die, you have to give up everything, you have Mother Teresa is not even good enough because she ate some food which she took out of the mouth of someone on their view. She didn't, but that's the, that's the view they work with. So if you have that psychology, if you have that premise ingrained in your brain, then you are never going to get credit for anything that you do. You're always going to be looking at the distance between you and perfection. I made a graphic for this and it shows that you can either focus on where you are in relation to the goal or how far you've come from your starting point. Perfection is the full achievement of the possible. You may have a goal that you can't reach yet. I want to learn how to play the guitar well. I can't do that tomorrow. But do I take credit for the improvement that I make between today and tomorrow? Or do I look and, well, I'm still not where I want to be. I'm still lacking that last segment of the journey. So you can either take pride in how far you've come, or you can be motivated by guilt and despair by looking at what you dreamed of being but are not or maybe never will be, and there's certainly not now. So really, there are two issues here. One is, do you set goals that are impossible? That's the idea. You can't be perfect, because perfect means full achievement of a goal, of a value. There's the, the view that perfection is impossible, the impossible dream. And that means no matter what happens, you're never going to get there. You're always going to be saying, not good enough, not good enough, not good enough. You will be Mr. Not Good Enough. That's a formula for self-hatred. Or if you think, if you, if you set a possible but distant goal, like I would like to learn to play the guitar well, you have to relativize your standard of achievement to how far you've come and what's possible to you in the next period. In the, today, do you get to where you intend to today? Do you make your best effort? If so, that's perfect. Now, this is assuming you have a, real, a realistic goal. If you set a realistic goal that you can achieve, but it's going to take a long time, Look at how far you've come, not, but I'm not there yet. Eventually, you'll get there because you're talking now about a possible goal, but distant. So the personal uh, consequences are, do you always damn yourself? Uh, not good enough, not good. Or do you say, wow, I couldn't have done this yesterday. That's great. I'm making progress. I'm moving where I want to go to. And even deeper than that, is your goal realistic? Is your goal, I want to play the guitar to a level where I don't have to think about what I'm doing when I play the songs, particular songs I like? Or I want to be Jimi Hendrix. Now that's not a realistic goal, particularly for a guy in his 70s like me. But if you have a realistic goal, look at what you achieve, not where, how much more you've got to go. So it's motivation by negatives, by guilt, by failure to get where you ultimately want to go yet, or by positives. Boy, 
I'm good. I got further. I'm better than now. I'm better today than I was yesterday. And I like that quote from Samuel Beckert, Beckett. Fail again, fail better. But don't look at it as failure. Look at it the way a child would. <clears throat> a child learning to walk. He falls down. He stands up. He walks a step or two. He falls down. He stands up. Now he's not thinking, oh God, I can't get this. What's wrong with me? I'm falling. I see the other kids around me are walking. I'm falling. There's something wrong with me. I'll never get it. It's impossible. I'm no good. I'm not good enough. He doesn't look at it that way. Quote, failure, quote, is nothing. It, it, he's learning. He's getting it. And he feels good about it. And that's the way you should be about any goal, assuming you start with the realistic goal. But the real anti-perfection doctrine doesn't start with a realistic, achievable goal. It starts with an impossible goal and then says, what's wrong with you that you can't do the impossible? I'd really like to hear a good sound bite, a good kind of elevator pitch on, according to the argument you're making and what you outline in that article, what essentially is it that you think makes perfection actually possible? The key to understanding this whole issue is that concepts are made by people. Standards are erected by people. They're not carved into a mountainside. They're not sent from God on stone tablets. People make up standards of the good and people judge how well they've been realized. Now, if someone makes up a standard of the good as follows, well, to be good, a person would have to be able to run 100 miles an hour. That would be good. Now, we can only run, what is it, about 18 miles an hour, uh, 15 miles an hour. The best runners can only do this. So we're all imperfect. We're all sinners. We're all guilty. You would say, well, wait a minute. Where did you get that standard? Why should men be able to run at 100 miles an hour? Where, I mean, you just dream that up. Even worse is the implicit standards of the Judeo-Christian ethics. Secularized as, by Auguste Comte as the altruist morality. Even worse than 100 miles an hour running is, well, to be really good, you would have to slice your body up into little bits and feed them to the world's hungry. To be really good, you'd have to sacrifice everything you have and die. You cannot eat a mouthful of food because someone else needs it somewhere. And if it's not a person, what about an animal? Feed yourself to the piranha. So even worse than a, an unrealistic standard in a positive direction, like run 100 miles an hour, well, it's good to be able to run fast, but where did you get 100 miles an hour? Is to be really good, you would give up your whole life. To be really good, you would die. But I see you're still here, so you're not perfect. That is the morality of self-sacrifice. And that is the wrong standard of morality. There's no justification, none, ever. It's just announced in the Bible and then secularized by August Comte in the 19th century. Everybody believes it. Oh, you've got to help the poor. You've got to help the unfortunate. You've got to devote your life. Of course, it isn't practical to devote your life to serving the needs of others. I mean, even Mother Teresa couldn't really give everything to the needs of others. So we're all stained with sin because we can't live up to the ideal, which is death. In Atlas Shrugged, Ayn Rand shows that the morality of, a, of sacrifice 
is a morality that holds death as its standard of value. She shows that the proper standard, the rational standard of value is life. Your life is your ultimate value and the requirements of you as a certain kind of living organism to live your life is the standard of the good. Man's life qua rational being is the standard of the good. By that standard, you can be perfect and you had better be. Any turn in your behavior towards death, any dilution of a pro-life course turning towards death, well, I think I'll just cut off my little finger and give it for scientific research or whatever. Any sacrifice of a higher value to a lower value is imperfect, immoral, against the standard of man's life qua rational being. So you had better be perfect because you want to live. If you don't want to live, get out of the way. So this, the essence of the reason why you can't say perfection is impossible is you made up the standard or you accepted somebody else's standard. It came from somebody's decision that this is what full good would be. But it's irrational. You should reject it. You should take a achievable standard and one based upon an actual value to you of which your life is the overarching value to you. Without life, no other values are possible. So I think you've just, you've given a good articulation of uh, what a rational standard would look like, what facts of reality would be based on. Uh, and you've said, you've, you've indicated its connection in particular to the, the needs of a living organism and the needs of human life. Um, but with that standard in mind, what does moral perfection actually look like? Uh, I assume you would agree uh, not everybody actually is moral, morally perfect, but you, you're arguing that they can be. What does a morally yeah. perfect person look like, and, and why is that possible? Read Atlas Shrugged or The Fountainhead, and you'll see morally perfect people. The heroes and heroines of those novels are morally perfect. But what your question is, is what is the the standard of moral perfection and what would it mean in principle to achieve it. The standard of morality is man's life qua rational being. So to be perfect means to have, in Ayn Rand's phrase, an unbreached rationality. It means that one never indulges in what one knows or could know to be irrational. What does that mean? What is it to be irrational? Well, it means technically, you know, directly to be against reason. Well, whose reason? Your reason. So there's certain things which to believe or to act upon requires that you lie to yourself. For instance, well, I'm kind of dimly aware that there aren't any arguments for the existence of God, but as my mother said, it's a crutch, I admit it. Which means I let my wishes dictate what I believe, rather than going by logic and evidence. So. A belief in God in this day and age is a very good example of something you have to suspend your critical, rational faculty to engage in. There's a lot of things which you have to suspend your mind in order to do. Generally, when people suspend their mind, it's to go along with the group. Ayn Rand had the concept in the fountainhead, it's a theme of the concept of the dependent or second-handed psychology or mentality. It's a person 
who instead of going by his reason, follows the statements of other people. He just believes what enough of his authorities tell him. We see those kind of people all around us. The virtue signalers, the crowd followers, the chanters of slogans who have no idea what they're talking about. That is an example of imperfection or more than that. So full perfection means using reason honestly, fully. You know this, this statement in court, the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. If you go by that in your mind, that is moral perfection, an unbreached rationality. And you're saying that's something that anybody can achieve, unlike yeah. the the altruistic standards. Yeah, it, it, it certainly is achievable because any element of it that isn't achievable is ruled out. Well, that's not achievable, so we don't mean that. For instance, suppose somebody says, well, you, you can't be fully rational because you have to go to sleep. Full rationality cannot demand that you don't get adequate sleep. So you adjust your standards to what is possible. You don't say, well, it ought to be possible to think 24 hours a day from the moment you are capable of thinking at age two or three until the moment you die. You shouldn't need sleep. You don't need sleep. It's a requirement of reality, of biology. So. So suppose somebody says, wait, minute, I can't go by the facts all the time. Well, you mean you have to rest or? No, no. There are times when I know perfectly well that something's a fact, but I, it's just not possible for me to accept it. Why? And why can't you, you know, there are cases where you're overwhelmed with something in which case, and you can't like deal with it now, you can't accept it, you can't take it in, you're too wrought up. And full rationality means you recognize, I'm not taking this in, I'm excited, agitated, I'll come back to it when I'm in a calmer state. So anything that is actually not, oh, See, now we get to the essential that I haven't named, Ben. Choice. Choice. Only that which is in your power to choose can be judged. You cannot evaluate facts that couldn't be otherwise. If something is inherent in your uh, nature as a human being, it cannot be bad. It cannot be good. It just is. It's like gravity. Is gravity good? Well, yeah, it holds down houses which would float. No, gravity is not good or bad. It's just a fact. So the, what we evaluate are choices. And the only standard for evaluating them ultimately is the requirements of action, the requirements of being in existence the requirements of life that provides the reason why you have to go by facts. You have to go by facts. You have to use your mind. You cannot indulge your whims because that train is coming. That's a fact and good things too. I don't mean to say it's only bad things. You miss the values if you're not mentally using all your available resources that you can choose to use. You can't choose to be Einstein, but you can choose to know what you know and use all the evidence that you can get given your present circumstances and present nature. How is your thinking on this overall topic informed by your understanding of Ayn Rand's philosophy of objectivism, not just 
uh, her, her ethics, which you've touched on just a moment ago, but, but more broadly, the way she thinks about standards, the way that she thinks about our concepts for standards, things like this. Well, it's not informed by the objectivist philosophy. It is the objectivist philosophy. There's nothing in here that's anything other in, in the article or in what I'm saying, that's anything other than restating what Ayn Rand has stated in a slightly different way and putting it together in a different way. It's, it's all from the rejection of mysticism and supernaturalism to the need to form concepts based upon reality, not imagination or subjective whims, to freeing yourself from unearned guilt. It's all Ayn Rand. And, you know, I wrote this article for the Objectivist Forum, and I had Ayn Rand's mailing list for it, and I showed it to her before publishing to get her editorial input. So this, I don't think here I'm going anywhere beyond, as I have in some other of my work, into things she didn't say. This is all kind of repurposing things that she already said. Could you elaborate a little bit more on the the point you made about how, in her view, you have to form concepts on the basis of reality, not on the basis yeah. of some kind of subjective whims. Yeah. Here, I assume that's applicable to how we understand the concept of perfection is formed and the concept of the standards of perfection. Right. Uh, could you say more about that? Right. And the concept of good that underlies the concept of perfection. Yeah. I think Ayn Rand is unique. If she's not, she's close to it among philosophers in holding that there are valid and invalid concepts. A concept can be formed right or a concept can be formed wrong. The difference is in terms of the cognitive purpose of concepts, something that she identified that no one else had ever thought of. The purpose of concepts, she says, is unit economy, is to save mental space so that other things can be integrated to a single unit rather than to an array of things. For instance, if you have the concept uh, table, it covers all the tables you will ever see and those which you haven't seen but were you to see them would have the same characteristics as that which you define as table. So when you think uh, tables have to be sturdy, your mind is able in one simple thought to range over all the millions and millions of things that are, are the concretes that are tables or will be made as tables. So a, uh, a concept like perfection, Christian perfection, Christian perfection is an invalid concept. So you have to judge the, every cognitive product you make, your concepts, your propositions, your phrases, uh, your implications, your, your connecting of um, things together into, into one whole, you're separating things into two parts. All of them can be done in a way that clarifies reality or obscures reality. The idea that perfection is impossible obscures reality and does not come from reality in the first place. So that's what I meant. Let's let's talk about that last point just a little bit more. So you had said that uh, Christian perfection is is impossible that it, that it's a that it's an invalid concept. And here I assume that 
what you're referring to is this is this uh, idea of the morally perfect as the as the as the selfless, the Mother Teresa idea that you referred to before. Now, I assume that part of a big part of the reason why this is an invalid concept is that uh, if its if its origin is in mysticism, in religion, in some holy scriptures, which you just don't think uh, has any uh, epistemic status to begin with, that's a big part of the reason why it's an invalid concept. Would you say that there's anything more to say about this? What are the signs that what we're dealing with here is an arbitrary standard? Uh, yeah. What are the oh, signs yeah, that it's sure. an invalid concept that God, doesn't there's... serve a cognitive purpose? There's all of epistemology is about that. All of logic is about that. Uh, tracing a cognitive product back to reality to see if it was derived from reality. Objectivism is a, I was going to say a big champion, but it's a big enemy of the arbitrary. The arbitrary is that which has no basis. It's different from the false. The arbitrary is something that's picked from the air and has no relation to reality. The false, what's false, has some relation to reality. It contradicts reality. But the arbitrary is from la-la land. It, it has no meaning. It has no sensible application. And... All of Christian ethics is arbitrary. It's not based on anything but Jesus said it. And the same goes for the utterances of Marx. From each according to his ability, to each according to his need. Oh, really? Why? Why? Well, because the haves have to help the have-nots. Why? Oh, come on. We are brother's keeper you know why it's arbitrary now try that with the objectivist ethics uh, you have to live your life rationally why because otherwise you'll be fighting reality rationality means accepting the facts of reality according to your best judgment of them well why can't I fight reality because you'll die fighting reality means you refuse to see the oncoming train no i don't want that to be there i think i can get across the intersection i want to be able to get across the intersection of my car before the train hits and i'm not going to pay much attention to the train because i just kind of you die so it's not arbitrary to say uh, if you violate the standards of our morality, you're in trouble because you lose your ultimate value, your life. Now, suppose a person says, well, I'm okay with dying. Why do you, why do you think you, you ought to live? I didn't say you ought to live. If you choose to live, then we've got principles and a manual to tell you how to do it. That's called ethics. But what if I don't want to? Well, then go sit in the corner and don't eat and die. So it's not arbitrary. The concept of arbitrary already presupposes that there's some person who wants to live and wants to know what the truth is. The presupposition of all judgment and evaluation is that you have some goal. And the goal of goals, presupposed by and implicit in any other, is to, to achieve goals, to be alive. So ethics is not arbitrary because concepts have to be formed on the basis of something. Christian ethics is formed on the basis of nothing. As I showed when I asked, well, why? Why are you your brother's keeper? Oh, uh, sputter, sputter. Versus our philosophy, our ethics, which says because your life depends on it.
Let me ask one uh, follow-up question as a kind of devil's advocate question on behalf of uh, the the altruistic ethics that that says that mm -hmm. uh, moral perfection or that moral standards generally are derived from what what actions serve the needs of others. And I suspect that someone like Sure might respond by saying, "I'm not sure what you're talking about." Uh, I think my standards are based on reality too. I can look at reality, and if uh, if you know if you describe a man ethics as a manual for achieving certain kinds of goals, well, the goal of ethics is to help other people, and there are uh, observable uh, cause and effect relationships between certain actions and and their effects on others. And so that seems like a cognitive purpose that my concept of the standard of the good is achieving. Uh, what, well, what would uh, you say in response? The first level of response is I wasn't talking about can you apply the standard? For instance, a man should be able to run 100 miles an hour. You can apply that. You can measure the speed with which a given person runs and say, well, it doesn't doesn't make it, but it was better than that other guy. So you can apply the certain wrong arbitrary standards to judge things in terms of the arbitrary, up to a point. But the question was, why is that the standard? Not, well, I can tell if people need things. You really can't. I'm going to say that as part two, but let's assume for the sake of argument, okay, yeah, you can, you can determine what will sacrifice yourself most to other people. But why is that the good? So this, uh, it's like this. Suppose your gra a teacher is grading exams. His implicit goal is, does the student show a good grade? grasp of the material I've taught in this semester. Now suppose, it's, and then he can grade that in terms of the answers to specific questions. Well, this person got eight of the 10 questions right and two wrong, so they get an 80 and that's a B. It's certainly possible, but suppose now that um, the standard were, I'm grading students according to how effectively they praise me. It's an arbitrary standard. Yeah, you can, you can look at a paper, oh, well, this one praises my looks, but not my intelligence. So it's a lower grade than this other guy who praised both my looks and my intelligence. You can apply that standard, but the goal is arbitrary. Now that's part one, but part two, the joke is on the guy. You cannot live by the standard. You cannot apply the standard of the good is that which serves the needs of others. What defines the needs of others? Now, uh, also there's this fundamental question, who decides what a person needs? So drug addicts says, I need that fix. You're living for me, give me the money. Can you say, no, that's not what's really good for you? No, you can't to be consistent because he's king. You are living to serve him. Who are you to disobey the king and to tell the king what will make him happy? He is your Lord and Master. He's not you. That's what entitles him to be your Lord and Master. You must serve what he says he wants. And the fact that you believe, well, he'd really be happier if he didn't get this cocaine, that's wiped out. That's only you. That's poor, pitiful, abject, servile you who only has reason to be on this planet to serve him, where him is any, any other person. So point one is service to others is arbitrary. Doesn't come from anything. Number two is you can't even apply it. 
Once you dig into it, you can't even apply it. Not rationally. Okay. That's that's really clarifying, uh, especially on the subject of perfection in ethics. Uh, I think I want to shift gears now and uh, go to a different subject, which I think your article also has implications for the subject of epistemology. Uh, at, at one point in the essay, you draw a kind of parallel between the possibility of perfection and the possibility of certainty. Uh, both, according to objectivism, are contextual. It occurred to me, though, that this is maybe more than a parallel because if you think about it, what certainty is supposed to even be is, is a, the complete fulfillment of a standard that you've done everything that you need to know and therefore you can be certain. So would you say that what you argue here also uh, clarifies why certainty is possible uh, as opposed to yeah. the arguments given by various kind of skeptical and pragmatist philosophers? Yeah, it's the same issue. Both reinforce the other. Understanding certainty helps you understand perfection, and understanding rational perfection helps you understand certainty. With certainty, the error is thinking that if, in order to be certain, you can't ever find that you need to expand your statement, modify your statement, or be mistaken. Certainty is an assessment of the evidence that you have at a given time. So it carries the proviso, according to everything known to me now, this is fully established. Now, not everything is certain. I'm not certain whether it's going to rain today. But a lot of things are certain, like evolution. Man evolved. All the forms of life that we see, the complex forms above the single cell, evolved from earlier, more simpler forms. At a, you know, when it was first proposed by Erasmus Dar Darwin, Charles's, uh, I think grandfather, might have been great uncle. It was not certain. It was a hypothesis. Well, maybe. I can see that, sort of, but they didn't have the evidence. After Darwin, and after a hundred years after Darwin, it's certain. All the evidence shows that. So, there are things that are established by the full weight without contradiction, without exception, without anything pulling back in the other direction. The full body of the evidence points in one and only one direction. And that's all you're saying when you're saying I'm certain. If somehow something is discovered the next day that makes you have to either retract it or modify it, that you should not say, well, I shouldn't have been certain. You should have been certain, just as you're now certain that the original statement needs changing. In the same way, perfection is compatible with improvement. This was a point that Ayn Rand made to me at, when she was editing my uh, manuscript. The killer is the view that if you can improve something, that means it wasn't perfect before. Perfection is full satisfaction of a rational standard of value. Well, what counts as full satisfaction? It's what's possible at that time. So for instance, a child learning to do something like to walk, he can be perfect at it given his abilities at that time, even though later he'll be able to dance. So perfect is relative to the possible at a given time, and that it can you can do better tomorrow. Uh, in no way undercuts and make, should in no way make you feel oh I was wrong to say it was perfect then. It was full satisfaction of the rational standard then, 
and it's full satisfaction of a rational standard now. So you go from, I mean, you don't, know, you don't always achieve perfection in regard to the physical stuff, but conceivably you do. You go from perfection to perfection. Morally, you should certainly um, go from, perf you should remain perfect. So while we're on the subject of standards in epistemology, I thought it might also be interesting to ask a question on a, another application. At one point in the article, you use examples from geometry. Uh, you talk about the perfect circle that uh, Plato said couldn't exist. And as I understand it, you're now writing a book on the philosophy of mathematics. Right. How does uh, the view we're talking about now feed into that book and what you argue for about math generally? It's the total basis of the book, and it, it means a revolution in mathematics, not in the content, but in the understanding of it, uh, to get Platonism out of mathematics. Here's, the, in essence, my approach. Plato says, look, the perfect circle, the idea, along, the idea of circularity in our minds is much better than reality. If you look out at anything, the moon, an apple, uh, a wheel that you make, because Plato lived in, you know, before much technology, although they had the compass, you know, to make something that looked very circular. If you look closely at it, it's not perfect. Nothing in this world is perfectly circular. So this world is inferior to the ideal world, the world of, of pure form, the world in which circularity unalloyed with matter exists in a kind of heaven. And that's what we should turn our mind's eye to and contemplate pure idealized concepts while scorning the senses and scorning reality and that is the opposite of what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the apple is perfect. Your use of the geometrical circle is an approximation to that perfect apple. The moon, the shape of the moon is perfect. It's really not perfect is just a fact. It's beyond perfect, but it cannot be imperfect. It cannot be damned. That's the standard. Reality, what the shapes that exist in reality are what we devise mathematics to approximate. So rather than saying there is in a, a heaven this perfect circle and we look down there and say, mm, falls short. Rather, we look at the world and say, I'm plowing this field and I want it to be circular. And I've got this standard which says equidistant everywhere from the center. And that helps me approximately figure the area, but, but it's not really that shape. So the geometer, geometer offers us simplified shapes that we can measure to deal with complicated reality, not complicated, complex, to deal with complex reality, complex shapes. Something falls short. It's the tools. You can't say, for instance, I've got this perfect screwdriver, but no screw is good enough to be turned by my perfect screwdriver. No, the purpose of a screwdriver is to turn screws. That's the only standard for judging it. The problem that screwdrivers are invented to solve is to turn screws, not to be kind of contemplated in another world. The purpose of x squared plus y squared equals r squared, to use the algebra, is to deal with the shapes that you encounter in reality. And it's to be judged as, well, this is pretty good approximation. Like the human face is about the shape of an ellipse. 
So that it's far from exactly that, but that's a good first approximation. And there's nothing wrong with the human face because it doesn't fit our first approximation. Now that's just kind of like the, the overview, the reorientation. Reality is better than math. They think math is better than reality. Okay, And almost all mathematicians, almost all, feel that way. That's why they went into math, to escape dirty, messy, material reality as they see it. And I know about it because I, I am tempted, I was a child or adolescent, was tempted in that direction and I went to MIT and I knew a lot of mathematicians and still do. And I don't mean to denigrate them because the good ones are objectivists and they don't have this attitude. The other aspect is that mathematics is a science of measurement. So leaving geometry in particular, and measurement has a precision associated with it. Something that Ayn Rand said led me in this direction. Uh, this is in the appendix to the second edition of Introduction to Objectivist Epistemology. The workshops on epistemology were transcribed and I edited them for creating the second edition. You can find this in it, but they're talking about perfection in mathematics and exactness. And she says, to say the length is this plus or minus two centimeters is exact. That's contextual precision. And the fact that you can use a higher standard when the technology improves you use, as she put it, some fancy apparatus, today we would call that the laser, to measure it more precisely, there's still an interval that it covers, but that's exact. So exact includes the degree, it's a statement of um, that includes how precise your measurements can be. It's That's really fascinating, book. Harry, and I, I really look forward to to seeing that book on philosophy of math. I think there'll, there'll be a lot to learn. Um, I thought uh, we'd wrap up with a with a kind of biographical question. Uh, you've mentioned several times now that Ayn Rand uh, looked at this essay uh, when you had published in the Objectivist Forum, and in the version that we're publishing in New Ideal, we have a excerpt from you at the beginning telling the story of your experience writing it under her editorial oversight do you want to share with us maybe just a yeah. little bit of what that was like at the time yeah because i really oh it's the most popular article i wrote in the eight years that i published the objectivist forum it's the most popular article and i owe that fact i think to ayn rand because our arrangement was that i had her endorsement and could use her mailing list from the Ayn Rand letter if I met certain conditions. And one of them was that anything I wrote for it, she wanted to see in advance. For things that other people wrote, who, since I was a publisher and the editor, it didn't apply to them, and she just wanted to know what the topic and theme was of what they were, but she didn't want to see it before it was published. But in my case, she wanted to see what I was writing. She wanted to protect the use of her name. She didn't want to sanction with her imprimatur something that she thought was wrong and anti-objectivist, so to speak. So I gave her a first draft of this article, The Possible Dream, and she very gingerly uh, and with compassion said, uh, it's going to have to be rewritten completely. And she, this was the conclusion after she told me many things that were wrong with it. She thought many things were right with it and the basic conception she thought was right, but it had not been carried out right. So I was 
very disappointed, but she was supportive and, and kind about it. And I put the project aside while I thought more about it and published something else. So I came back to it two or three week, uh, months later to do and rewrote the whole thing from a new outline. And I used in particular her point that people think the perfect is that which cannot be improved upon and that this is a killer. That had not even occurred to me, but it, it was a great point and uh, she liked it the second time. So that's what got published. And, you know, it, it isn't that she went over every line. My first article, she and Leonard Peikoff went over every line. My very first article, The Swing to the Right, in the Objectivist Forum, February 1980. And again, the version I submitted to her, neither one of them liked it at all. But in that case, I had written an earlier version, which I brought in to show, and she did like, so I didn't have to do the, the rewrite I did here. But I really profited from the rewrite and from the idea of reorienting it to you can always improve upon perfection or you can often improve upon perfection. Improvement does not retroactively invalidate that which was perfect in its context. So you said that you profited from that kind of oversight. I think I think we all profited from it and from your uh, rewriting of it and uh, from sharing with us to publish on New Ideal today. So thank you for all of that, Harry. So I'd like to share with our viewers some resources for how they can learn more about some of the ideas that we discussed today. Uh, as we mentioned, the Possible Dream was originally published in the journal that you edited, Harry, the Objectivist Forum back in the 1980s. And if you go to hbletter.com store, you can order a copy of the hardbound edition of the Objectivist Forum, as well as other books by Harry, and even, I believe, individual issues of the Objectivist Forum. So uh, that's something that you can check out. But as I, as I mentioned, we've also republished The Possible Dream on the website of New Ideal. And if you'd like to take a look at that, at the online version of that article, you can see it if you go to bit.ly slash possible dream one and bit.ly slash possible dream two. It's in two parts. We just published part two this week of March 2nd. Uh, and I also mentioned that uh, Harry is the author of a book on epistemology, a topic that we've said a number of things about today. That's how we know epistemology on an objectivist foundation. And you can learn more about that book and, and also buy a copy at how-we-know.com or at uh, any of the places that you usually buy books online like Amazon. So uh, I'll just also remind you that if you enjoyed this podcast today, you can always, we would ask you to follow us on YouTube by clicking the subscribe button and the bell button to get notifications when we go live and when we post new content. If you're watching the recording of this, please like the episode, comment on it, share it. That helps optimize the algorithm to attract new viewers. Same thing on Facebook. Please like and share and comment on the recording on Facebook. Uh, and if you have questions or comments about today's episode, uh, I can forward your questions to Dr. Binswanger or try to answer some of them on my own. Uh, and if you have questions more generally about objectivism uh, or suggestions for new topics for our podcast, please send those to newideal at einrand.org. We read all of your emails and reply to most of them. So thanks again, Harry, for joining us. I think this was a really fascinating conversation. I hope... Uh, I hope uh, uh, our viewers are able to learn more about what you've, what you've said on this and some of the other topics that we discussed today. Thank you. And uh, you should also mention HBTV, which is on Mondays coming from London. Excellent. Yes. So we will make sure to let them know about that as well. Thank you, Harry. Thank you.